And then it would be, you know, two o'clock in the morning when he would show up just completely drunk. And then when it was time to go get his kids the next morning, we would wake up and it would be, oh, go grab them for me. So is it possible that you drove him to drinking? Oh my gosh. Anything's possible. (laughs) (laughs) You're listening to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we discuss all things step family related, real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. Welcome to the Nacho Kids Podcast, brought to you live, well, not live, later live, (laughs) from pollinated South Carolina. It's virtually live. It's virtually live. Everybody's doing virtual nowadays, right? Yeah. Virtual meetings. But this isn't virtually live. No. Anyway, back to the pollen. Uh, so this time of year, my white card gets to turn yellow. Mm-hmm. And even when I wash it, it's yellow again in 30 minutes. Well, I spent two hours taking everything off the porch the other day, washing the pollen off everything that was on the porch, washing the pollen off the house and the porch. It was crazy. Yep. But the good thing about the pollination season is we get the beautiful red bud trees. Is that like those little purple trees? Yeah, my favorite little purple trees. I wonder why they call them red buds if they purple. I don't know. Look it up. <laughs> I don't care that much. You know how I make up words. Yeah. Yeah, you do. What was that you did the other day? Um, oh, I said, <laughs> you were telling me about a news article or something. Uh-oh. And I said, did it come from a credible source? <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a minute. It was something like somebody got locked up. You were brushing your teeth. But somebody got put in jail. And she's like, look, somebody got put, so-and-so got put in jail. And I was like, is that from a credible source? As he said that with a toothbrush and toothpaste in his mouth. And she looks at me and she goes, is it based on her credit score? (laughs) (laughs) I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, they locked him up based on her credit score. Well, (laughs) in, in my defense, even if you wouldn't have been brushing your teeth, you still would have thought the same thing. Well, I had a lot of ear infections and stuff when I was little. Oh, so here we go. I got some scar tissue. It all there. started when I was seven. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's my life. I say stuff like that, and she comes out with something completely different. And I just get to where I look at her and go, shake my head. The kids think it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Your son looks at me like my mom is a complete idiot. And I'm like, I know. David. What? That's horrible to call me a complete idiot. No, your son calls you that. Just because I heard something different? Yeah, that's how mean he is to you. All right. The next episode, you're going to talk with a toothbrush and toothpaste in your mouth and see what people think you say. Okay. All right. So (laughs) on the next episode. (laughs) But your son called you an idiot. I'll deal with that later. (laughs) What you going to do about it? You need to do something about that. Look here. He is not your kid. Look, you need to do something about that. He is not your kid. (laughs) But you need to do something about that. You need to mind your own. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Your son's called you a bunch of stuff too They sure did What you gonna do about it? I already done it What? What did you do? <laughs> I run them off <laughs> You did not run them off <laughs> Yeah Don't you just miss those days? No, me neither Okay, carry what, on With all your kids here? No, where you were like Oh, they did such and such What you gonna do about it? I don't think I ever did that But people do that though I think I was more like In my head They did such and such Or not in my head I would say they did such and such. What and in my head, I'm it? thinking, what you going to do about it? No, you would say it. Did I? Yeah. No. Or you would insinuate it. You would look at me that way. You you read my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe because what's on your mind is usually coming out your mouth. Well, too bad I can't read your mind and know that you wasn't talking about somebody's credit scores when you were brushing your teeth. Yeah, it's a good thing you can't read my mind. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you would a be confused. <laughs> I'm already confused. <laughs> so... You know, none of us were prepared for this pandemic. Mm-hmm. What's the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic? The difference between a pandemic and an epidemic, and I did not go to Wikipedia for this information. <laughs> I went to some reliable source. <laughs> did they have a good credit score? Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, see, stop. Uh, okay. An epidemic is a sudden increase in the number of cases of a disease 
more than what's typically expected for the population in that area. Okay. A pandemic is an epidemic that has spread over several countries or continents affecting a large number of people. So you can't have a pandemic without an epidemic. Interesting. Mm -hmm. There's also a, something called sporadic and endemic. Okay. Sporadic is when a disease occurs infrequently or, and irregularly. Well, that means sporadic. <laughs> I got that one. An endemic means a constant presence and or usual prevalence of a disease or infection within a geographic area. Hmm. Hyperendemic is a situation in which there are persistent high levels of disease occurrence. So is there anything worse than a pandemic? Are you going to make me Google that? No, I was just wondering. Let me see. Is there a worldwide any, pandemic? Anything worse? <laughs> well, it has to be a pandemic across several countries. Yeah, but that doesn't. That doesn't mean it's worldwide because if it was stuck on one of them countries over there. Right. Yeah, where they all smushed together. So I guess it's just called a global pandemic. Is it pandemonium at that point? I don't know. Oh, then we have outbreak. An outbreak is a sudden rise in the number of cases of a disease. An outbreak may occur in a community or geographical area or may affect several countries. It may last for a few days or weeks or even several years. Hmm. Well, then what's the difference in an outbreak and a pandemic? Because <laughs> one's a virus and one's a disease. Okay, well, here we go. A pandemic is a global disease. Oh, never mind. Outbreak. No, this is coming from another reliable source. Good credit score? Good credit score. <laughs> it comes from creditscore.com. <laughs> A pandemic is a global disease outbreak. It differs from an outbreak or epidemic because it, number one, affects a wider geographical area, often worldwide. It infects a greater number of people than an epidemic. It's often caused by a new virus or a strain of virus that has not circulated among people for a long time. Humans usually have little to no immunity against it. The virus spreads quickly from person to person worldwide, and it causes much higher numbers of deaths than epidemics. And lastly, it often creates social disruption, economic loss, and general hardship. Sounds familiar. So those are pandemics. Hmm. Interesting. I would yeah. have loved to have known that in a different way than to have lived it. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you remember studying in school, the Spanish flu of uh, 1918, mm -hmm. you know, it killed between 20 and 40 million people. That's about how many divorces we're going to have because everybody's stuck in the same house. And then in 2009, the H1N1, wasn't that the swine flu? It was one of them. Was more a recent global pandemic. They had the swine flu, the avian flu, the mad cow disease, the hoof and mouth disease. What else did they had? They've had all kinds of stuff coming around. Seems like every three or four years, something pops up. Oh, and here's some stuff you can do for preparation of a pandemic. What? <laughs> It'd been nice to know this three months ago. <laughs> oh, well, maybe this is what's happening, y'all. Somebody read this once the pandemic started, and that's why there is no food, masks, and all that stuff. Because listen to what it tells you. Plan ahead in case services are disrupted. This is especially important if someone in your family has special needs. For example, make sure they have a way to fill needed prescriptions. Make a list of important contacts for your home, school, and work. Talk with your neighbors, workplace, and school about how to plan for staying home if you or your household members are sick. Here's the ticket. Buy and store at least two weeks' supplies of food, water, medicine, and face masks. That's what's happening. They're telling people to buy two weeks' worth of this stuff. <laughs> and yeah. now the doctors don't have face masks or the nurses. Yeah, and then to find out that they're really... You know, useless for what other people are wearing them for. I don't know. Now they're saying that you can just take a bandana and put it around your face and it's protective. Mm -hmm. Who knows, man? Nobody knows. Just just wrap your face up with a... Everybody should just buy a ninja mask. <laughs> just buy a ninja mask. Everybody just run around like a bunch of ninjas. And then when you go to the, the store, they'd be like, you can't walk in here with that mask You're trying to rob somebody. Hey, you just gave a bunch of robbers... <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Well, some stores, have, of course, you know, it's usually at Halloween, but they usually have a thing on the door or during the wintertime, you know, take off your hoodies, your and hood or hoodies or because, I mean, you know, every criminal wears a hoodie. Mm -hmm. Well, 
you know, they do that so they can see them on a on a camera. Video. Yeah, That's on a right. camera. I want to see the camera. Yeah, smile. What's funny is you see like the Walmart cameras, people trying to, you know, find this person they stole from Walmart, and they are the worst cameras. They're like 1930 cameras or something to where you can't even tell if the person is a person. It looks <laughs> like it's a Ghost Hunters video. <laughs> but then you see these little rinky-dink stores, mom and pop shops, that'll say, this person stole from us. Man, you can count the person's eyelashes. <laughs> yeah. But Walmart has the crappy camera system. Sometimes. Yep. So anyway, what do you think about Zoom, David? I think that I'm going to wait until you get on your next Zoom call and run around behind your mind to wear. You only know about that because I told you. I know. It's funny. And then you said, did you go watch it? I'm like, well, I want to go watch some dude run around his underwear. <laughs> well, no, because you asked somebody else if they'd watched it. And I was like, did you look it up? You're like, no. <laughs> you no. made it sound like you'd seen it. Nope. I ain't seen it. Well, what it is, is it's a Spanish lady. And I think she's a teacher. And for some reason, I'm wanting to think it's for like younger kids. I may be wrong. And she's speaking Spanish. And all of a sudden, you see her husband come out talking to her. And he's got a shirt on. And it's whitey tighties. Tighty whities. <sighs> I'm just kidding. You had it right. <laughs> whitey tighties. Tighty whities. Oh, my gosh. I'm so confused. <laughs> okay. So he comes out in those white underwear, like the Fruit of a Loom <laughs> fruit people used to wear. Fruit people? Yeah, they were fruit people. Okay. Fruit of the loom. they just fruity. But they had, like, the grapes had on the whitey mm. tidies. Yeah. yeah. But it is tidy whiteys, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so the dude comes out, and, <laughs> you know, she's, like, mortified, and she's trying to wave him away, and it was just, it was hilarious. So I guess you can Google Spanish teacher, whitey tidies. I mean, tidy whiteys husband or something. I don't know. That probably wouldn't be a good thing to Google. Why don't you put it in the show notes? <laughs> I'll find it and put it in the show notes. There you go. That would be safer, wouldn't it? Yeah. I hate for your husband or sniffy other to walk in while you're Googling some dude in his underwear. That is true. Yeah. That is true. All right. Well, y'all know that's my phrase that I use to try to get David off whatever subject he's talking about he shouldn't be. You know, we hear it all the time with blended families. You knew what you were getting into. Did it sound you that way? You knew what you signed up for. Mm-hmm. Well, we know that's a bunch of malarkey. And this woman that is our guest, boy, she didn't have a clue. It wasn't just blended stuff she didn't know. It was stuff about her husband. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. What was it? Tell me. Not telling you. You got to listen. Come on. Give me a hint. It is about her husband. Sheena was a man. Sheena, <laughs> his name wasn't Sheena. Oh, okay. And wait a minute. He he would have been a man. He is a man. <laughs> he's a cross-dresser. No, he's not a cross-dresser. He, this a, is not the Jerry Springer show. He's maybe. a murderer, a serial killer. No. He lives in his mama's attic, and she's dead, and he wears a wig and sits in the rocking chair in a Victorian-style house with a shade pulled down and the lights on and runs the hotel. Is that the Bates Hotel? Yeah. See, you know about him. <laughs> Is it really the Bates Hotel? Yeah. Oh. Yay, Lori. Yeah. That's the hotel for uh, Norman Bates. But I don't remember. Psycho. I don't remember that. Of course you do. You're old. No. <laughs> no. All right. Okay. Well, so, let's get to listening. All right. Yeah. I'm interested to hear what uh, what the husband got hidden up in the closet. I can't tell you. Skeletons up in the closet. All right. Well, let's hear. Or up in the attic. (laughs) Yeah. A word about the Academy. There is a way to save your sanity and your relationship, and it's called the Nacho Kids Academy. In the Nacho Kids Academy, you will learn the skills and knowledge to properly nacho, techniques to handle step family challenges, ways to improve your communication, and much, much more. Visit NachoKidsAcademy.com and sign up today to join other step parents who are seeing the life changing benefits of nachoing. Again, that's NachoKidsAcademy.com. Today, we have Stepmom Maria. Hey, Maria, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Doing well, doing well. <laughs> hey, Maria. Hey, David. <laughs> I like how you say, hey, David. <laughs> 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 yeah, you get to be the lucky one to record with me. 
Yeah. <laughs> I should have told you to re- um, schedule it during the day so you wouldn't have to deal with David. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. I think I can take it. Girl, I don't know. This is just the beginning. <laughs> yeah, you haven't been in my house. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't sat beside David for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, Maria, you have been in more than one blended relationship. Yes. Uh, I was with a gentleman for almost two years, and he had three children. Uh, very close in age to my twins, who at the time were three years old, and his kids were four, five, and six. And I went into it very, very starry-eyed, had no idea whatsoever uh, what blending meant, how to get along with an ex. Uh, My ex and I have a pretty good relationship. We do very well. We co-parent. We talk to each other before big decisions are made. You know, we have some minor issues, you know, which are unavoidable, but I had no idea what a high conflict relationship could be. Mm -hmm. Uh, Come to find out he was an alcoholic. And uh, when the kids would come every other weekend, he would kind of just take off. And I was then mom to you know, five little kids under the age of six. And because I didn't have enough strength and a backbone to stand up for myself at the time, didn't really know that what was happening I didn't deserve, I kind of put up with it. Mm-hmm. And it got, it got really ugly. And I kept trying to figure it out. And I was you know, out there looking for material and reading books. And I went to therapy about how I could fix all of this, how I could be the better parent. <clears throat> and in the end, you know, it wasn't me. I wasn't the bad parent he was. <laughs> I know exactly how you feel. Uh, David. <laughs> <laughs> he had an ex-wife that he, you know, still was, um, they weren't done yet. And I think the bottom line is they were still enmeshed in each other's lives personally. And, you know, we can take that for what it's worth. Uh, But I didn't find out until about 18 months into it, how enmeshed they actually were. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, I ended up having to walk away and I felt like such a failure that I just couldn't make it work. And that I had brought these children into my children's lives. And I had said, you know, these are, you know, these are step siblings that, you know, we're going to love them just like we love, you know, each other. And I made this big to do about how we were supposed to behave, what society really had told me we were supposed to do. And when they all walked out of our lives, I had these poor little kids that just were devastated. They didn't know why their, you know, siblings were gone, why they never were going to see them again. Right. And it really left me gun shy <laughs> of doing this again. <laughs> but it didn't stop you now, girl, did it? <laughs> it? No, it didn't. But I was much, I thought I was more cautious. Let's put it there. I thought I was more cautious. And I kept, um, I've been married now eight years and I kept my husband away um, for at least nine months. I didn't let him meet my kids. I didn't want to meet his kids. You know, he could come over, but only if the kids were asleep, uh, those types of things. Cause I really wanted to be more cautious and I went into it with a lot more trepidation, but it seemed like they had a mom who was taking care of them. And I never, ever thought that I would end up being a full-time stepmother ever. Mm-hmm. And uh, two days after my husband got home from Afghanistan, The judge gave him full custody of four kids, and my life turned upside down again. And so I just kept going back to that first relationship, like, what did I do wrong there? And even then, I kept thinking it was me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't giving my partner any accountability for their actions or lack thereof. Right. Um, I want to go back to your second husband. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. The alcoholic. She's like, you can go back to him, mm-hmm. but I ain't. 
(laughs) (laughs) Are you kidding? He's blocked on everything. I don't even think he knows I exist anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Smart lady there. You said you found out that he was an alcoholic. Is that something that you saw warning signs of before you got married, or you were just completely shocked to find out that he was? I was shocked because when we had been dating and we had been out, I had no clue because he would have a couple beers, but that was it. But it's when we moved in together, I noticed that the beers on Saturday started at 10 a.m. And that, you know, you'd go out to dinner and it'd be time to go home. And no, just one more. Okay, 10 minutes later, we've got to get home. We ha- I've got to get to my kids. Well, I'm going to have one more. Well, I have to leave. And then it would be, you know, two o'clock in the morning when he would show up just completely drunk. And then when it was time to go get his kids the next morning, we would wake up and it would be, oh, go grab them for me. So is it possible that you drove him to drinking? Oh my gosh. Anything's possible. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I grew up, my dad was an alcoholic. I, sh- I you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I should have seen it. Uh, but once again, I think sometimes when you live certain lives, you have such a desire to be loved and to be needed that you're so willing to look past huge glaring red flags that were there that you that should have stopped you Mm -hmm. but that desire for completeness and to give your kids this you know complete family just kind of overrode my um my senses well right and he was already your second husband so you didn't want another failed relationship no and it really it was hard for me i mean i i was you know in my gosh early 30s in the mid thirties. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this work. And, you know, it lasted 18 months. Wow. And when it was over, I was, I think I was pretty crushed and pretty devastated, but I also on the complete opposite end, I think I felt such relief because I was grateful that my children were so young that they hardly remember him. Mm -hmm. They have some brief, like, oh, I remember that guy who had this car, but that's all they have of it. Right. So it didn't, it didn't end up affecting them the way that I, you know, catastrophized that, you know, I had ruined their lives and I had sent them to therapy until they were 40 and they were just going to be, you know, their whole lives were going to be destroyed because I made this mistake. Right. I kind of want to address the drinking thing just for a second. (laughs) I was married before, and he drank a lot. And it used to make me so mad that we could not go to a restaurant unless they served alcohol. That is true. And that wasn't something that I had seen until we got into it. And there's a, we live in New England, so there's a lot of puritanical towns that still don't, like the South, don't serve alcohol. And there were certain towns we couldn't go to for dinner. I'm like, oh, hey, let's go try this restaurant. Oh, no. But I realized later it was because they didn't serve alcohol. That's sad. But didn't understand it in the beginning. Yeah, that's sad. And, you know, when you walk into a bar and everyone's head goes up and everyone goes, Norm, (laughs) you know you've got a problem. (laughs) But I didn't realize it at the time because I just was being stupid. (laughs) You weren't being stupid. You were being (laughs) um, blinded by love. I don't even know if it was blinded by love. I really don't. I'm trying to help you out here. (laughs) (laughs) No, you don't even need to because I'm real big on owning your actions and what your actions and what your behaviors do to your life. Mm -hmm. And I was so, and and honestly, I was just so desperate to have a family that I was willing to accept less than I deserved. I think a lot of people do that. I see it every day. Oh, yeah. That reminds me of a um, of a post I put in on Facebook uh, a while back, and I got some backlash for it, which I often do just for the heck of it. But <laughs> I um, I put a post on there that you know life is made up of your choices and things happen. Things don't happen to you; they happen because of you. And and, and so it sounds like you've kind of embraced that, where you know these things happen to me because of the choices I made. And I've owned up to it 
and you know, I move on and I do better. I learn from it. I think the only way you can grow and become a complete adult is to look back on your choices and say, wow, I've learned from them. I grew because of them, but I still made mistakes. And I think so often people don't want to ever admit that they were wrong. They didn't do the best thing. And people try to color their lives with these rose-colored glasses, and that's not reality. We're human. We're fallible. We, we make mistakes. But if we're not willing to own up to them, we don't learn from them. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah, because if you don't own up to them, then you're denying them, and so it never really happened. And it's a never-ending cycle then, Mm -hmm. yeah. because you're just going to repeat the same mistake. Yeah, I completely agree. And I feel like that there's no such thing as failure. As long as you've at least learned something from it, then it's not a failure. If I can take one thing away from a bad experience, I count it as a win. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I completely agree. Now, you mentioned your job, that you see it a lot. Um, Tell everybody what you do. Well, I'm a certified divorce coach. And I do mediation of parenting plans for divorcing families and families that have outgrown the parenting plans that were part of their original separation agreements or divorce decrees, you know, whatever you call it and what part of the country you live in. Um, I I help them try to reevaluate what they're doing, to look at the behaviors that they're using and what and how they affect their children. Because in divorce, everyone wants to be the winner. And even if they don't think that's what they're doing, they're they're definitely keeping hash marks as to what they've won and what they've lost when they go to court. Mm -hmm. And I think the best thing I ever heard was when I went to court and, you know, stood in front of this judge who didn't know me from anybody, you know, my ex on the other side, and I've got these two amazing little creatures. And... They were only two years old and the judge looked at my ex and looked at me and said, do you love your children? So of course, what does everyone say? Oh, I would die for my kids. I would do anything. I love them. And the judge looked at me and said, I don't, I don't love your kids. And all I'm going to do is do what I want. And do you really want to let somebody who knows nothing of your life decide what is going to happen to your children's future? Man, that is an awesome judge. Yeah. And I, and, he, and the judge said, walk out, take all the time you need, come back and let me know what you think. And we walked out and we created a parenting plan within 30 minutes. <laughs> wow. Because we didn't know what this judge was going to do with our children mm-hmm. that we had tried so hard to have that we both loved so dearly, but we were both trying to deprive the other of our child because we wanted to win. Right. And in the end, we would have broken our kids had we done that to them. And now I've got these 14-year-old twins who just, they have no idea of what a nuclear family is. They've been raised in, you know, several different types of environments. They are well-adjusted, happy, funny, get good grades, you know, say please and thank you. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. You know, come in the house, throw their backpacks down, do their homework, know that there's no TV or video games until after everything's done. And that's just who they are. But it's because their other parent and I are on the same page. Right. And that makes a big difference. Um, I know in my situation, that is not the case. We are not even in the same book. (laughs) Mm, And that's so hard. Mm -hmm. And I think David... um, I don't think y'all were in the same book. You may have been. <laughs> yeah, we were in the same book. So we were just reading it differently. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's actually, I've never heard of it that way, but that's such a good analogy. Mm-hmm. Because we can all hear a sentence. You know, the game of telephones are a really good example. We can all hear a sentence or read a sentence, but we can all interpret it completely differently. Mm-hmm. You know, that always got me in school. You would have to read this stuff, and then you would have to, you know, the reading comprehension. What did you get out of Mm -hmm. this? And I would tell them, and they would say, that's wrong. How's that wrong? (laughs) How can you tell me what I got out of it's wrong when that's what I got out of it? 
oh, that's a whole other different story about what's wrong with some of our education yeah, that's true. system, mm-hmm. that they don't let our children be free thinkers. But I think in my job, I try to remember that these two people typically both really love their child or children. And they're just, like you said, David, they're reading the same book, but they're reading it differently. Mm -hmm. And I have to get them to look at the same sentence and comprehend the same thing. So it takes a lot of patience, a lot of, um, a lot of energy, a lot of time, but mostly you just have to listen because if you can get them to understand that they're each saying the same thing, they're just saying it different and get them to remember that they respected each other most of the time at the beginning and try to get them to find that commonality that they can do it again, but in a different way. Now, was that your job uh, before all this or did that push you into that role? I was a social worker and uh, I got my degree in social work and went to work uh, for the Department of Children and Family and uh, had, um, I was not made for that job. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. I couldn't send children back to homes that uh, I did not think they belonged in, mm-hmm. but uh, the courts might have thought that they did because family reunification is always the goal of the Department of Children and Families. And sometimes I really think families just aren't right for the child. Right. So I did that and then I took a break from that and I went back to the restaurant industry for a while because that's what I knew. That's what I grew up in. My dad designed concepts and we moved every six to nine months all over the country when I grew up. And I went back to that. But as the kids were getting a little bit older, those really late nights and having to get up early uh, were difficult. And My current husband uh, was going through a custody battle for his children, and his attorney one day said to me, you're really good at this. Let me teach you this profession. And he brought me in with not knowing anything, and he has created a law firm that is quite different than most law firms. What we do is he handles everything legal, obviously, because I'm not an attorney, but we found that about 80 to 85% of divorces are emotional. It, there's nothing legal about them. It's all about your emotions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we're able to keep our clients' costs down because I'm a heck of a lot cheaper than he is. And we're able to give them emotional support through a divorce where they don't have to call an attorney and spend three, $400 an hour when they don't really care how you're feeling. Mm-hmm. They just want to get you divorced or argue in court. Right. And the more they can make you argue, the more money they make. Yeah. And, but we, we, ha- we took a completely different approach to it. And as a result, over the last seven years we've worked together, we've collaborated in a lot of different ways and, and created, I think, what would be a really ideal type of environment for family law attorneys. Right. To stop the, let's just charge you a million bucks because you want the cat and he doesn't. Yeah. And just talk about why, you know, the whys of what you're feeling and get to the bottom of that. But uh, most times clients don't want to do that because they're spending three and four hundred dollars an hour with the attorney and they don't have time to do that because they cannot afford it. Mm -hmm. With the type of environment we've created, it's possible. Right. So I take that into my lifestyle with these blended families now and how I deal with it and try to always remember, no matter what, there's another side to the story that not everyone is evil. You know, bio mom is not always evil. You know, I'm a bio mom. I'm a stepmom. Neither one of us is evil. We're just looking, as David said, we're reading the book different. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly. Now, what do you do when you have two people that just cannot get along? I put one upstairs and one downstairs and I run up and down the stairs <laughs> and, and say, okay, so, and I take all the anger and all the vitriol and that stupid, you know what, and that stupid, you know who, and I say, well, you know, your spouse really would like you to know. <laughs> 
and I use what I call my mommy voice. Mm -hmm. It's real calm. And sometimes it just can't be done. They're just too angry. And I tell them, and that's fine, but you're going to have a judge decide the rest of your life. And I can only think of one time it didn't work. And unfortunately, that was with my current husband. (laughs) Yep. No matter how hard I tried, no matter what I did, because I didn't really understand my role as a stepmother and your, you know, Nacho Kids has really given me so much more knowledge as to my role as a stepmother, which has really helped me with my, with my job is that sometimes you just can't make someone see that the sky is blue, Mm -hmm. even though it is, because they're going to say, nope, it's gray. (laughs) Now your current husband, he wasn't a client, was he? No, he wasn't. We uh, found this attorney together and the, in the year that he was deployed to Afghanistan, uh, I worked really close with the attorney and took everything on my shoulders. You know, I, I did everything. And if I had had it to do again differently, you know, hindsight being twenty twenty, I I wouldn't have. I, I I would never have helped him fight the way that I did for his kids. Uh, because now that I know what the end game was for three of his children, nothing that I did would have made a difference. Unless I I think if I had known about Nacho then, it might have made a difference. So, so how, how did you find Nacho and, and tell us about what, what got you there? Like what, what kind of issues were you having? Were you starting to look for, uh, for help and answers? I was ready to get divorced again. I was crying every morning on my way to work. I was walking around with a knot in my stomach, crying on my way home, not wanting to come home. Um, getting my, my children and, and leaving as much as I could. And I started looking at stepmom groups, hoping that I could find somebody who could help me, someone who could give me some information that was going to release me from the shackles that I truly had self-imposed on myself as to what I should be doing. Because as you know, Lori is always saying, you don't have to love your stepkins as your own. But society tells you you do, or, or you know what you were getting into. Hell no, I did not. If I had known, I would have turned tail, run for the hills, and changed my name. So I was in another stepmom group where I just said, I don't like my stepkids. And, well, let's just say they got rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> but this woman had found my name. And she said, you know what? You need to try this group. It's called Nacho. And I, that night I, you know, sent my request, Hey, please, please take me. I need somebody (laughs) else. (laughs) And it slowly brought me out of this. And what really, really helped was Lori called me one day because I think I was at the end of my rope. I was ready to throw in the towel. It wasn't because I didn't love my husband. I I love him dearly and I loved him dearly then. But being a full-time stepmother, because he had full custody, the mother only got the children every other Saturday and Sunday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. That was it. And I was was at a breaking point. And she called me and she said, you know, you don't have to do that. I said, what? Do what? She goes, everything. And little by little, by reading the post, by listening to the things that Lori was saying and um, some of the other moderators, I was able to start unpacking my own baggage and go, okay, well, I don't need to take care of this because if you don't like my cooking, you're old enough, you know where the kitchen is. Okay, you don't like the way I'm doing your laundry. Guess what? You can do your own laundry. And as I started unpacking my own baggage, it freed me to remember how much I loved my husband. Because a lot of times the stress with the stepkids clouds that and your focus is completely on the stress and the stepkids and how things aren't working. And 
once you can step back enough and feel that relief, then you're like, oh, I love them again. I unfortunately don't think that is ever going to be the case in in my life. I think because I found it too late for the damage that had been done and with with a very high conflict birth mother who as soon as the children turned 18, she swooped in like a bird of prey and you don't have to listen to them. You don't have to love them. You don't have to do anything. I'm here. Mama's, mama's back because all the hard work was done. Yeah, I was talking about my husband though. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we just want to know where you go with that. <laughs> I was able to love him again. And we have such a good relationship. We laugh, we joke. Our house is so full of laughter again and joy that, you know, all of my kids, um, their friends are like, I wish our parents were like you guys. You guys were always laughing and joking. And, you know, you want to say, and I, and I do sometimes say, you know what? Life isn't always like this. Sometimes it's really hard and it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And it's, but we put in the time and I went back to therapy. And I worked on myself again to go, okay, how can I fix what I don't like? You know, how can I make it to work? Sometimes it was just, how am I going to make it to work today without crying? Right. And it's just, it was one, you know, if anyone's, you know, for, you know, AA, one day at a time. And sometimes it was one minute at a time. Mm -hmm. And I had to remember that, but the group and being able to read so many diverse stories and because your group is is so diverse you've got young you have old you have you know wealthy you have poor you've got everything because everyone is searching for how do I make whatever life I have livable and if if I can't what do I do mm -hmm. and some people are real quick to say oh leave them you know go you know leave but so many people have so many great stories and so much advice and knowledge that it's this collective brain that you've created that, you know, it's kind of like how, you know, hey, <laughs> or, you know, Magneto's, you know, brain chamber and X-Men. So you've got all of these brains together in one spot from all over the world. And it's like, hey, sometimes I don't need the answers. Sometimes I just need to ask the question. Mm -hmm. Those people that um, you know jump in and tell you to leave, it, they drive me nuts because I love when they start with, if I was you, I would blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Uh, because there's a huge difference between a problem that you're telling somebody else to solve and then a problem that you're trying to solve that's yours. It's a very, very big difference. Living a problem is, like you said, it's, it's vastly different. And, you know, I can tell people to do a million different things, but the fact of the matter is they're still in that life. And a lot of these women or men, they, fi they financially can't afford to just take off and leave. You know, they've got children to think about. And, you know, sometimes they just need, you know, for lack of a better word, just like a virtual hug to say, take a deep breath and maybe come back to it tomorrow because it's not going to get fixed overnight. It's definitely not going to get fixed in one post on social media. Mm -hmm. It takes so much work to go from one blended relationship to another and to learn from your mistakes and to grow from those mistakes. And if you get the proper help, and I really do think you, you two created this group I think actually probably saves more marriages than stepchildren relationships mm -hmm. because you remind each other, you remind people, Hey, it's the two of you first. And then you kind of say, you know, those children, you don't have to take on their baggage. They've got parents, right? Whether they have one parent or two, they've got a parent because you're married to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And let them handle it. You stay in your sandbox. Let them deal in their sandbox. 
But if your spouse needs your support, that's when you're there. Right. You can be their best cheerleader ever, but you don't take over their job. No, and and that is, God, that is hard. And I struggled at that, and I failed at it. And I I did. I failed at it miserably uh, with a couple of my husband's children. But I learned. Mm Mm-hmm. And I now have a 15-year-old stepdaughter who is a sophomore in high school. She, you know, obviously she lives with us full time. She is kind, sweet, nice, helpful, considerate, uh, is an A student, but I don't discipline her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if dad has to do anything, even if it's a decision that needs to be made, hey, can I go here? I say, Gosh, you know, honey, you got to ask your dad. Well, dad's not answering. Well, you know, when he gets home or when he gets out of whatever he's doing, he will respond to you. And I'm sure you can wait. But until then, I just can't say anything else. Right. And as a result, we have a good relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if I had found you guys earlier, <laughs> <laughs> I think this would have been a completely different in-game scenario for us. But I'm grateful and thankful that I'm able to have it with one of his children. You know, I do want to go back and and marinate on something a little bit that you said. You you went to great lengths to talk about how you have been working on yourself and how you've taken what you've learned in the in the uh, group and you're applying things and and you're figuring things out. And I want to stop on that just for a second because so many people have the same information at their fingertips and they do nothing with it and still expect to change. You mean they're doing the same thing repeatedly and getting the same results and they're shocked. Why? <laughs> it, it blows my mind. And I honestly have to, to not go into the Facebook group sometimes because people will <laughs> ask, you know, what should I do in this situation? And they get, some great feedback. And then you see the same person in there two or three days later asking the same question. It's like, well, did you try any of these other things? Well, no, I didn't, I didn't try any of that. Or you point out that the problem is, you know, the problem is not the problem you think it is. You know, you're talking about a symptom. I helped you find the problem. Now deal with the problem. And then they won't do it. And then uh, this doesn't work. No, it works. You're not working. I think what I see in that, in that respect, I'm 47 years old and I've lived a few different lives. And I think that that kind of, I think the old adage wisdom comes with age is really, really appropriate. I came from a very, very troubled background. I was adopted. I had an alcoholic father. My birth mother was an addict. The family that raised me had substance abuse issues. It, it was just chaos. I grew up in chaos. So chaos became very, very comfortable. And I think people unpack their chaos and they settle in with it. And I, and I think that as you get older and you start to get a little more tired and your energy levels you know, maybe aren't as high <laughs> as they were in your 20s, kind of cut, I'm really tired of this. And I think you have to be tired of the chaos. And I think a lot of these young women in the group, and I don't mean to say everyone who's young is like this. I don't want to say that at all because there are some very wise, sage, you know, young people out there. But I don't think they've had the life experience to learn Mm self-reflection. Right. You know, one of the hardest things for me when we were having our troubles and struggles, I was, I was about to say struggles. I, I like to yeah, do that a lot. We have those too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was realizing my part in it and mm-hmm. not necessarily my part in it as far as me engaging, but as much as um, me not realizing how snippy I was or. I try to tell you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like telling a woman to calm down. You're just asking for her head to spin like Linda Blair and the Exorcist. It doesn't work. <laughs> I know. 
I tried. It's like, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> David is a button pusher. <laughs> oh, see, my husband is the stoic, quiet type that if I start to spin like a top, he he's a sheriff. He just keeps his cool all the time. Yeah. And he will just stand there. He crosses his arms and he purses his lips. And of course, I will stomp up the stairs and slam a door. And then I think, huh, wait a minute. I have one more thing to say. <laughs> boop, 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 back down the stairs. <laughs> and another thing. And he just stands there through it. He just looks at me until I've pretty much exhausted myself. And then I go, oh, do you want to talk about it? He goes, yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> Man, he's awesome. He's really, really helped me to learn that I don't need to unpack my chaos, that I can just kind of throw it away. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, he was married to his ex-wife. He knows what that's like. I don't need to tell him. But for some reason, I think as women, we often think we need to point things out that are very evident because we think, oh, he's a man. He's not going to get it. <laughs> When they get it, they're just not going to talk about it the way we will. <laughs> right. Go, a- go ahead, David. <laughs> I'm trying to refrain. <laughs> <laughs> but, Lori, I think you're right that we have, to, we have to realize where we played a part in it. And I know I can be, you know, neurotic and completely crazy sometimes. I get that. But when I'm in the middle of it, you know, I don't, I don't see it. I think I'm being completely logical. And of course I'm being reasonable as I'm, you know, shrieking like, you know, a mad woman. <laughs> we call it a banshee around here. <laughs> yes. Very, very good. And I did it with his kids a few times, you know, probably more than a few times because I couldn't understand why they just didn't want to be good people. Why don't you just want to clean up your bedroom so that you can go to dinner with us? And I just would push it and put, because I am a a neat freak. First of all, I am beyond a neat freak. It's really bad. And I, and I admit it. And it's, it's one of my good traits, but my worst trait is my desire to have everything in order. But because of all my personal work, I know it's because of how I was raised and I require order, but I can't require it from everyone around me. Right. And they don't need it like you do. Yeah, they don't because they really could care less. They literally can walk over garbage, dirty plates, and they can sweep the crap off their beds that (laughs) is stained and has like mold growing on it. (laughs) And they're very comfortable. And I'm on the other side of the door going, huh? 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 (laughs) We must disinfect. (laughs) But see, that mold keeps them warm at night. Exactly. <laughs> nice protective barrier, nice fuzzy, because God forbid you use a sheet. Well, it is a fun guy. <laughs> <laughs> that but was corny, I know. We've got, that was good. But we've got to remember, these, they're not our kids. When we came into their lives, they had histories, and they're not our histories. Mm-hmm. And we can't project our histories on them. Right. And it took. It took me seven years in this marriage to learn that. It didn't take me that long because we weren't going to make it that long. (laughs) No, we weren't. But it's hard. I remember um, David's kids, me coming in and being like, okay, they need to do this and they need to do that. And why aren't they studying? Why are you letting them play? And we come in and we have good intentions. But there is a saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we really do come in with the best intentions. And it's almost like we come in as a, um, I want to say dictator every time. That's not it. What is it, David, that I'm trying to say? You know, Oh, it is dictator. Okay. As a dictator. That sounds good. I was. Yeah. And then we... W- I was a correctional officer of my prison. That's it. That <laughs> is it. That's it. I'm going to tell you what to do, how to do it. Because these are my rules and that's it. Yeah. Either that or I'm going to put you in solitary confinement and you're going to get, you know, loaf for dinner and that's it. Uh huh. Did you say loaf? Yes. That's what they give people in solitary confinement in prisons. Oh, I thought it was just bread. 
No, they take all the food the other prisoners don't eat or are eating for dinner, like the, the vegetables, the bread, the meat, and the sweets, and they put it into a big baking tin, and then they slice it up, put it in a piece of wax paper, and that's what they get. Ooh. Yeah, it's disgusting. Watch a prison show on Netflix. It's gross. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they got the same food. Well, I guess they do. It's just. Nope. Oh. No, not if they've been bad. See, not if they've been bad. If they've been (laughs) deemed to be bad, their privileges are taken away. And that's how I viewed it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it got me nowhere. Yeah. Except into a world of hurt. Well, and it caused problems with you and your husband, correct? Oh, absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. Because he. Although I think there were times he wanted to fix things. I think he just was so overwhelmed because he knew who their mother was. And he thought, if I push them, I'm going to lose them. So he, uh, he just rather take the road of least resistance and just accept who they were for who they were. And my, you know, my screwed up brain couldn't comprehend that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they feel stuck in the middle. Yeah. Oh, he was. Oh, he was like, you know, the Berlin Wall. And we were, you know, I was on one side and his kids were on the other. And, and I don't know how he withstood it. I really don't. Because if I had been him, I would have divorced me. <laughs> I really would have. Yeah. Because it, it really, it wasn't him. It was me. And because I learned that, I'm able to take it. And now that I finally learned that and I accept it and I've examined it from every angle, you know, known to man, because I am one of those types of women who just needs to understand things and, you know, pick them apart. It was my fault. I was the one creating the drama and I was the one creating all of these issues. And if I could go back in time and change things, gosh, wouldn't that be nice? Mm -hmm. but I can't. I have to accept my role. I have to accept what I did, apologize where I can apologize and move on because I can't change it now. Right. And I don't know about you, but once I did realize that it was me, then there was strength in that. It was a weakness, but at the same time, it was a strength. It's almost like it hurt my feelings, but learning how to overcome that gave me more strength than anything I've ever went through. I I agree with you. You have a member of your group and she always says, is this a battlefield you're willing to die on? Sylvia. Yes. Mm -hmm. And she and I have clashed numerous times, (laughs) but I've always been able to respectfully look at each other's point of views. And I respect that about her. Mm -hmm. And, but I had to realize one day when she said that, and once again, that's something I use in my, my practice now, too. And I will say to my clients, is this a battlefield you want to die on? Right. And it's, it's a good analogy, especially for men, because they get that war mentality and they're able to understand it. And the only battlefield I am willing to die on now is, is my main part of my house being clean. I do what you want in the rest. In your private space, I'm just going to close the door and I'll put more, you know, I'll hang the little trees on your, your door handle <laughs> and I will put eight Febreze fresheners and scentsy things in your room so I don't smell it. But I'm able to, to let that go now, but only because the group gave me this idea. It's like, really? Are you going to lose your husband because you really care so much about how that kid's room looks and they're not going to be there forever? Exactly. So I'm like, huh. I would leave and him I if would, I was wow. you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, I had, I went, wow, God, that's simplistic thinking. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And then you go, well, well, thank you for smacking me upside the head with that fish. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to lose my husband because in two years or three years, this is all going to be gone because they're going to move on to their own life. You know, unless you have one of those 30 year old kids that's living in your basement, but that's not happening in this house. But <laughs> I just think when they get their own house, you can go to their house and make it dirty. <laughs> I do that to my son. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a 28 year old son 
and I love him. He is a good kid. We had some struggles. He bought his own home a year and a half ago. And shockingly, you know, I'm his mother. He chose to buy a home near me. His dad lives in California. I live here. We have a great relationship. But he chose to live near me. But I'll go to his house and say, Mom, would you like a glass of champagne? Absolutely, honey. And then I'll put it on the counter. He'll go, you know, the dishwasher's right there. I go, ha, 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 ha. And I walk out. <laughs> you should say, I absolutely know it's right there. Talk to you later. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think it's kind of funny. Oh, it's hilarious. Um, David can't wait to go visit his son so he can leave hamburger wrappers all over the house. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I just want to go over there and just because he, you know, he never locks his door. And I just want to go and like just toss crap in the door to his dog and just let the dog like rip it up. And when he comes in, he's like, what the hell happened here? <laughs> do it. Do it. Hey, that was my life. <laughs> that was my <laughs> that life. Was my life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you leave and you come back and it looks like an explosion happened. Yeah, he came home a few years ago. Uh, he was um, a bomb tech in the military. He defused bombs mm. and uh, he got hurt. Oh, no. So he, he was in a, yeah, he was in, um, he, so he out processed in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia was where they out processed, out processed him. But he met a girl when he was down there. And he calls me, he says, mom, I'm, you know, getting out process, I'm coming home. I'm only going to stay for like six weeks until I find a house to live. And I went, uh-huh, right. Comes home, he goes, but I got to tell you something. And I hope you're okay with it. He says, I'm bringing a girl and a dog home. I went, what? So I went to my husband. I said, look, my son wants to come home and he wants to bring his girlfriend and apparently her dog. And he looked at me and the look of utter joy on his face was like, ha, 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 the shoe's on the other foot. <laughs> like, now you're going to see what, and he comes home with this girl and the dog, and, you know, he was just a pig, and he was just leaving messes everywhere. And I said, look, if you're going to live here, you're going to have to take care of this. She goes, mom, I'm not going to. He goes, but I will get a housekeeper, so you don't have to do it. And I said, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, smart kid. <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah, it says, I grew up with you. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's funny when that shoe goes on the other foot, isn't it? Oh, yeah, because he looks at me, you know, and he mouthed off to my husband one night. And my husband said, you will not speak to that, you know, speak to me like that. And, you know, they kind of did the, you know, the peacock thing. They both puffed their chests out, you know, two grown men. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I went, okay. And so I said, so I you know, kind of stood back to see how this was going to go. And then he looked at me and he goes, I shouldn't be doing this, right? I go, probably not the best idea. I said, but who am I to tell you? Because I've made a ton of mistakes. So you make your own. <laughs> <laughs> I love that mentality. Who am I to yeah. tell you? Make your own mistakes. Yeah. Leave me out make of it. Damn fix. And now they're, because my husband didn't, he backed down. He goes, you know, it's not worth it. They are the best friends now. My son calls him dad, says he's his best friend. They hang out all the time. They do so much together. He'll call. He doesn't call me. He calls my husband. That is hey, awesome. Hey, you want to go grab a beer? You want to go do this? They are the best friends. And I went, oh, Paul was nachoing before I knew there was nacho. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think men are just innately better. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Say, that. say that again. I no, no, no. Be, be careful <laughs> what you say. No, she broke up. What'd she say? <laughs> I got to be honest. I just think that men are innately better at not seeing the chaos. They they don't jump into the drama. They just walk away from it easier. And I, so I think, you know, in my situation, my husband was definitely better at it than I was. You know, he gets, you know, a gold star for every day of the year because he is definitely better at it than I am. Mm -hmm. Girl, David ain't going to be able to walk out the door now. <laughs> Look, she's just saying the same things I've been saying to you for the longest time. Why do you pay attention to her now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just try to give him his due where it's due. And, you know, he's he did a good job. And he did things I couldn't. And, you know, kind of showed me that, you know, sometimes I can back down. I can, I can walk away. I don't have to get in the middle of it. And at the end of the day, if I can do that like he does, we're just not going to fight. 
Right. And that's one thing that Nacho and taught me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because, girl, before, oh, no, Lori's not walking away. I'm going to be up in your face. You're going to hear my words while you feel them, you know, the heat from my face. My heat from my face. David, stop doing your hand like that. You're distracting me. (laughs) He's doing like the little yappy hands. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, but that's that's me. And like I said, I would I would stomp up the stairs, slam the door. I would calm down. Yep, yeah, slam the door, and then I would think for a second. Hmm. He said something. What's a good comeback for that? And man, it, I don't care how long it took me. Once I had a good one, I was back down those stairs singing it again. Now, let me tell you something funny, Maria. Had, what? Uh, we have a. You know what an auto closer is on a door, right? Like, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. okay. So we <laughs> we put an auto closer on our front door. Because the kids could never, you know, either they, either they couldn't close the door or they would slam the door. And so we put an auto closure on it. And so one one time during our uh, heightened um, stage of problems, Lori was yelling there and she walks out the door. And she tried to slam it. And it wouldn't slam. <laughs> it, it just made me and madder. That, oh, that had to piss you off because I can imagine what that would have done to me. And I was like, what's wrong? I Slam probably the door. Tried to figure out how to break the damn door. <laughs> Don't think I didn't try. <laughs> but man, I, w- I went uh, from like I was mad at the moment and then seeing her try to slam the door that wouldn't slam. I just about lost it. It was so funny. <laughs> oh, gosh. But, you know, I think from one blend to the next, you, ha- you have to grow. And if you stay in the same place, you know, there's the saying that, you know, you can cry just, and you can have problems. You just can't sit down, unpack them and stay there. Mm-hmm. You can't remain stagnant. Yeah. So many people just stay in the same thing. And I don't care if you're wealthy or if you barely have enough food on the table, or if you don't have enough food on the table, taking a walk outside is free. Right. And getting some fresh air, getting away from whatever is bothering you. I don't care if you have a car, put on your coat, go outside and walk around the house if that's all you can do. Mm -hmm. Because there's, you know, babies inside or kids inside, you know, throw them in their cribs, whatever you've got to do, you know, put a net over them (laughs) and just get a second for yourself. But people have to learn self-reflection. And I think without self-reflection, there's no growth. Without growth, you are destined to stay in the unhappiness and chaos that you choose to. And it really is a choice. You have given people a pathway out of it. You have laid out very clear golden bricks, you know, the yellow brick road to the Emerald Palace (laughs) that is the Emerald Palace perfect? No, it is not. You know, there's some weird color changing horses there. But, <laughs> you know, you you can get to a better place. Yes. But you have to walk through some really dark woods to get there. But people aren't willing to do it. And that's, that self-reflection leads to self-awareness, which is, a, which is also a big component of what we teach in the academy, that you have to come to a point where you have a heightened sense of self-awareness and then you're able to see things so differently than you were before. And you learn that you have a level of control that you didn't know you had. It's a gift. It, what you have created through your pain, through your trauma, through your difficulties is such a gift to the people that you share it with so freely. And it's, People try to manipulate it to fit their own mind's eyes opinion. But you are the creators of this world. So the only person who has control over those rules is you. And you're saying that this is not the right way to do it. And you get this backlash. But I truly think it's because people, David, don't want to self-reflect. Right. Mm -hmm. We are our own worst enemy when we refuse to look at ourselves as part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember somebody had sent, I don't remember if they sent Lori an email or what it was, but they said that, you know, listening to the podcast and, and some of the other videos that we have out there, 
they did not like the fact that Lori kept saying that she was the problem. And um, the person didn't say this, but it almost felt to me like they were saying that I was like, I had put that on her. Like I was telling her she was the problem. Like you were blaming me. Yeah. Because I think sometimes some people live that life where the, the man is saying, well, you're the problem. You know, and, and I'm well, not. I'm not very the problem. narcissistic behavior, right? And I've always, I've always accepted that I had a role in it. It's never been just Lori was an issue. We both uh, were um, were doing things that were wrong. I had very wrong expectations and, and of what I expected out of her, which put her in a position to do some of the things that ended up backfiring because she was trying mm-hmm. to fit the expectations that, that I have for her and that she had for herself. And that society had for me as a stepmom. Right. So all that oh, was, was going on at the same time. But, um, you know, it, it's, not that, it's not that it's bad that you realize you're the problem. In fact, and I've told uh, somebody in the academy this before, when you discover you're the problem. Part you of should, the problem. Or part of the problem, but <laughs> um, but in some cases, somebody does have a little more of the problem than than the other person. But I say, mm-hmm. if you find out that you uh, are carrying a lot of the weight, or if you're any part of the problem, you should rejoice that you figure that out because you can change you. You can't change the other person. Absolutely, you only have control over your own actions mm-hmm. and your own beliefs. You just cannot force anyone else. And my husband will be the first one to tell you. I shouldn't have given you everything because, you know, he came home, he was dealing with his own personal issues from having been in a war zone. He got full custody of four kids. And there I was a very good put together mom for my children. And obviously, you know, bio mom there on the other side wasn't, or she would not have lost full custody of her children. And so he just, he put them all on a platter and said, here, here's my kid's do the same thing with them as you do with yours. Mm -hmm. Be the mom. But I couldn't. But I couldn't because they came with 14 years, 10 years, and four years of experiences in life before me. Right. And, you know, and he's like, I am so sorry I did that to you because I set you up for failure Mm -hmm. because I just figured I didn't have to do anything because you were so good at it. Right. And, you know, he realizes that now. So when, you know, I realized I, I was the majority of the problem because of my, my personality, but he, he takes responsibility for what he did to create the, the situation. And had we both known about this type of, you know, behaviorism, you know, what, what Nacho is, we wouldn't have put ourselves there. And if society wasn't saying, Hey, you know, you've got to love those like your own kids. Cause you know, that's what you're supposed to do. And of course you should, you know, bend over backwards and contortionist yourself to, you know, fit their lives. We wouldn't have put each other through what we put each other through for so many years and created a really almost a toxic environment because we were so opposite of each other. Right. And once we got on the same page, we're like, hey, those are your kids. You do your thing and I'll do mine. And he's like, hey, but yours are really, they're, they're better. I'm like, hey, I don't know what to tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but you know, I, I have a different co-parenting relationship. And I think that those, all of those different components make such a different balance to what happens at the end. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm, I'm grateful that I found this. I'm sad I didn't find it sooner. You know, none of us know what the future holds. And, you know, I certainly hope that my husband's relationship with his children can be repaired. And that one of these days they see that everything he did was from a 100% place of love because he wanted to protect his kids and he wanted to make sure they were safe Mm -hmm. and that I did the best I could with the limited amount of knowledge I had and 
was I wrong sometimes? Hell yes, I was wrong. Am I, do I regret the way that I behaved sometimes and the manner in which I did things? A hundred percent. I really do. But I learned. And even if nothing ever gets better, and even if I'm not able to make amends for the past, I did in a way because I changed and I was able to become a better person for his 15 year old and a better step parent and a more loving step parent, more accepting because I realized I didn't have to do anything. She has a father who's 100% capable of taking care of it. And I get to be an Mm add-on as someone who loves her. And you can never have too many people loving you. Mm -hmm. I agree. One thing you said a few minutes ago was having laughter back in the house. And I remember... Say that again, I'm sorry? About having laughter back in the house. Yes. I remember... Dreading coming home. David dreaded coming home. The stepkids dreaded coming here. Um, my kid, I don't know that he really did. He was a lot younger. And I remember once I disengaged, feeling almost um, reclusive to um, what was going on because I, I had to step back physically. So a lot of times, you know, mm-hmm. I was in the bedroom and I remember sitting there one day and I heard him laughing and I was still, you know, kind of grumpy. And I was like, oh, it must be nice to be in there laughing and cutting up, you know, while I'm in here <laughs> pouting. And so I was like, wait a minute, I can be a part of that. And I went in and I started kind of reengaging. And it, it didn't take five minutes for one of them to do something to annoy me. So I went back to my room. And but the laughter we have with these kids after I've reengaged, girl, we could have a television show it is hysterical to get us all together and laugh and we cut up with each other. And um, it's amazing to think how far we came from that actually hating each other to mm-hmm. cry laughing. I mean, we will snort laugh and <laughs> just, you know, we have the best time now. And th- that's what I think part of the group, um, a lot of people come in and they aren't struggling like you were or like I was where you were crying every day and just miserable. And they're like, oh, you hate your stepkids? How horrible of you. Well, they just haven't suffered as much as we did. And then they here we are where we've overcame it and it's like look how far we can come if we can come from that you can too yeah my my son said something to me my my oldest son who's 28 he said you know mom he goes the the family that you have now he said is the family I wish I had had growing up and first of all as a mother that just kind of breaks your heart yeah it broke mine for you because I just you know, I thought, God, you know, I took you to Europe and, and you know, you, you, we went to Asia, we traveled all the time. You had, you never wanted financially for anything, but I wasn't happy. Right. And now I don't have very much, but <laughs> I'm, I'm happier than I've ever been in my entire life. Mm-hmm. And he goes, I see it, mom. And he goes, and I just love seeing you and Paul laughing and the kids are laughing and you know, we go out to dinner and we do silly things and we do all these family activities. He goes, I love it. And I was like, gosh, and I wish I could have given you this through your you know, formative years, but I'm giving it to him now and I'm modeling and I'm portraying a healthy relationship for him so that even though he's an adult now, he can still learn. He can still see what's possible and he's, he's appreciative of it. And no matter how old we get, no matter how far down the road we are to, to destruction, there's always room to come back. That's right. That's right. I remember um, David and I pick a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and we were at one of the kids' volleyball games. Well, it was probably the triplets' volleyball game, so two of them. Well, not the triplets. Anyway, <laughs> one of the kids... Um, friend said, man, I think your parents need to get divorced <laughs> because <laughs> they were arguing a lot. Well, we were just picking because that's the kind of relationship we have. We just pick on each other a lot. And yeah. we just thought that was hilarious. Yeah. Because you two are very happy and content with each other. We are. And 
I want to ask you, since you learned how to nacho, have you noticed it helps you to be more content in other areas of your life besides just the blend? Oh, goodness gracious, yes. I mean, I, I, I nacho everything now. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, when my boss, I used to be when my boss had a bad day, I took that day on. Mm-hmm. And I would try to fix the day for him. Now I'm like, oh, gosh, you're just having a bad day. Okay, I'm just going to go over here, and when you're done, you come back on over. Right. Or, you know, um, in-laws, the lady at the store who I literally just want to take my grocery cart and run over because I think she's being an idiot. I just go, you know what? Never mind. It's not your problem. And all of my girlfriends now, it's kind of funny. You know, all of, I live in a very, uh, you know, New England, uh, especially in this area, is very, um, it's very different. Uh, all of my friends are, are married to their, their first husbands. And they're still together and they've you know, been together since they were eighth grade, ninth grade. And I just completely don't understand this. And they all live, you know, two miles from where they grew up. And <laughs> it's very, very different. And I don't understand that. But now they'll say to me, um, oh, don't, I, I nachoed that. My kid was doing something. I said, nope, nacho, not doing it. And they all use it now as a terminology <laughs> when they're done with something and they're done with someone's behavior. And they say, and they're not going to take it on anymore as their own. They mm-hmm. all say nacho, mm-hmm. and it it goes to so many. Di- it can go to every aspect of your life. It can. It really can. And it's it's freeing. It it takes so much weight off your shoulder. You know, I've been going through some significant health issues over the last year, and with with your own personal health, you truly want to take every bit of control you have. Mm-hmm. But because of this experience, I'm like, you know what? I don't have any control over this. I am not a surgeon. I am not a specialist. I cannot web MD myself to health. (laughs) I have got to listen to everyone else and pay attention to what they're telling me because they're the preeminent specialist of what they're telling me. Mm -hmm. They tell me I need to sit down and quit doing crap. I really need to do it because they know better. Right. So it really has given me a different perspective that I can let go, that I don't need to have all the answers in any aspect of my life because I'm not dead and I'm never going to know everything as much as I like to think some days I do. (laughs) Yeah, we all have those days. (laughs) It's freeing and at the same time, it's empowering once you realize that you don't have to worry about everything and stress about everything because you can't control it. But what you can control is how you let it affect you. I can let the fact that the kids didn't do the dishes make me mad for four hours or not. It's my choice. Yeah, it's it's been a gift. Yeah, and what they choose to do does not mean that I have to let that affect me. And if people could hear that, and really take it to heart and figure out why they can't allow it, mm-hmm. then they could find that freedom and that empowerment. Right. I just feel calmer. I am definitely a calmer person than I was 18 months ago. I'm a c- calmer person than I was six months ago. Mm-hmm. Health crises and my husband, you know, Losing contact with some of his children has really become such a an eye opener mm-hmm. that the universe has a very different idea of its plans for us and for me than I do. And you know, whether you're spiritual or religious or an atheist, whatever it is, you can't control everything. Mm-mm. And if you try to, it's like trying to control the rotation of the earth. We, have, we can all go to one side and jump at the same time. We're still not going to change it. Right. But it's once you get that, you know, I breathe easier. I, I laugh more. I sleep better. All of those things have just been lifted off my back because it's, you know, it's really not my, it's not my damn responsibility. Yeah. I've got enough responsibilities that I don't need to take on yours and yours and yours and yours and yours. Right. Mine is to take care of myself and to make sure I'm raising productive, kind members of society who are going 
to do their their best. They're not going to be perfect, but they're going to do their best. And accepting that has just been, like you said, freeing. Mm -hmm. It's like not doing the mental Xanax. It really is. And it's almost meditative if you let it be. Mm -hmm. If you just sit and close your eyes. And, you know, I had someone in the group, um, you know, the little panda from uh, Kung Fu Panda. Yeah. And he's sitting there meditating. And I said to one of the ladies, like she was always making these cute memes. And I said, can you make me one that says, you know, these three words, they're nacho kids. And sometimes when I sit and I'm trying to calm myself down because I'm upset about something, I just close my eyes and I think of that little meme and I'll, I'll just replace kids with whatever is bugging me. Mm -hmm. And just seeing that silly fat little panda thinking of him eating dumplings and (laughs) him just going, Hey, look, I'm just going to eat my dumplings and, you know, worry about being a panda, you know, with stork parents, simplicity. Right. Just taking things back down to simplicity rather than overthinking everything. Right. And you found your anchor thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's that stupid panda that says it's not your problem. (laughs) (laughs) Mine's the monkey. Um, Oh, yeah. The um, from the Lion King. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. (laughs) Because I had somebody make me one that says they are not your kids. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's, you know, everyone's got to find something, but that's it. You got to find something. Because mm-hmm. you will go crazy unless you find something. Right. That is so true. Well, David, you got anything to say before we let Maria go? I'm just over here meditating. <laughs> 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 okay, David, what's your what's your meditating animal? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Tasmanian devil. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to think about Lori. <laughs> Oh, well. oh, that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was fabulous talking to you guys. I really appreciate it. And, and again, thank you for creating this group that is financially accessible to everybody because it's free and that you're willing to share so nakedly what you've been through to help make people you've never met feel better. It's, it's a special gift that you guys both have, and, and I am you know, forever grateful and thank, th- thankful. So thank you again. Oh, that makes my heart happy. Because, girl, I'm an introvert, so all this stuff isn't real easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys take care. Have a fabulous holiday season, and I'm sure I will, uh, I will see you on social media because you know my troubles still aren't over, regardless of how calm I might seem. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, You have definitely offered a lot of good insight to people. And we're really thankful that Nacho Kids has helped you. Yep. Uh, Well, I am. I am grateful. I would shout it from the rooftops. Believe you me. (laughs) Go ahead, girl. I'll do it with you. (laughs) Yeah. Just put it on video and send it to us. Yeah. (laughs) I'll YouTube that crap. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Well, thank you again. And we'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Well. That was amazing. You don't even know what it was about. <laughs> it was about him dressing up like his dead mama. <laughs> now, what did he do? He was an alcoholic. Oh, and she, she found out after the fact. You were part of this interview now that I think about it, because <laughs> I remember you saying, uh, do you think he call, you caused him to drink? <laughs> I or wouldn't you, dare say that. You did. Or you made him an alcoholic? I wouldn't Th- dare say you did. that. You did. I would not dare say that. You did. And I'm going to make it the sound bite for this, too. I would not say that. Yes. I'm very did. sensitive. Yep. That's what that's what happened. But yeah. So not yeah, only did she. Well, I mean, but is he, he wasn't drinking a lot early on. That then, she knew of. And then he married her and then started drinking. It just kind of goes hand in hand. No. I think I'll have a drink. Matter of fact. Great. That's all I need to do is be married to an alcoholic. That will be your first time. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) That was on my list of don'ts. Is that what it was? Yeah. If you can't go to a restaurant that doesn't serve alcohol, then eh, you got to go. Well, good thing we go to Taco Bell. Mm Mm-hmm. Taco Bell. All right. So that was... uh... But that was her first blend. Oh, David's memory is not the best, y'all. No, I mean, you know, it was five minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, she went into the first blend like most of us, starry-eyed. 
Was you starry eyed in your first blend? You were my first blend. <laughs> so yeah. No, I wasn't starry eyed. You were smitten. I was smitten, but I thought I really wasn't starry eyed. I thought that we had a good grip on that it wasn't gonna be easy, but apparently I was blind in one eye and couldn't see out the other. You just didn't know how not easy it was gonna be. Nobody knows. You knew what you were getting into? Oh Lord. You knew what you signed up for? Mm-hmm. See, and it still makes me mad when somebody says that. <laughs> It's like, give me a frying pan. I'm going to hit him in the head. <laughs> so needless to say, not only was he an alcoholic, but she he was still enmeshed with his ex. Mm. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when she said that, I was like, hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 But her second blend, she's doing much better. She was a lot more cautious when she went into that one. I'm sure she was. I'm going to be more cautious in my next plan, too. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you forgot this, David. She's a certified divorce coach mm-hmm. and does meditation of parenting plans for divorced families. And Meditation or mediation? <laughs> mediation. <laughs> 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 it's been a rough day. I was like, that's interesting. They just sit there and meditate on the plan. Look here with your digilent self. We're going to meditate on the plans we have for your divorce. Just think about it. <laughs> Let's just think about it for a while. Um, you know that might be a, that might be a good business to get in. It might. You want to get divorced? Come on, and we'll get some divorce meditation happening. Now, look, David's making so much fun of me, <laughs> but when he said "digilent" instead of "diligent," nobody, I didn't make that much fun of him. Nobody knows about that. They do because I <laughs> released it on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't edit it out. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh huh. Y'all, you know, with this uh, pandemic, David and I are stuck at home together a lot. We're not stuck. We love being together. Well, you know, people are saying that. Instead of saying, I am stuck at home, you need to say, I am safe at home. And I agree with that because, you know, I'm all about that positive thinking. Mm -hmm. Think positive. You are safe at home. You're not stuck at home. Nope. You can go out if you want to. So now I'm (laughs) safe with David at home. So... I can't tell y'all what's going to happen with these podcasts. They they probably going to get off the chain a little bit more than normal. Mm-hmm. Because as you can tell, I have, I'm have i struggling with my words. <laughs> I hadn't shaved since we got put on house arrest. He hasn't. He looks like a woolly booger. <laughs> yeah. And he hadn't even shaved the part of his neck that makes it look like you're growing out a beard. Like, I mean, it's just. I ain't, I ain't shaved nothing. I just look like Grizzly Adams. No, Grizzly Adams look good. Look at him. <laughs> People are like Grizzly Adam. Who is that? I'm th- well, I don't even remember what he looked like. But didn't he look good? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. I'm thinking of Smokey the Bear. <laughs> Smokey the Bear? You're talking about Smokey and the Bandit. Oh, yeah. You just like the car. Yeah. Anyway, I digress. No, you digress. I didn't digress. I said Grizzly Why does Adams. everybody digress so much? I never heard that word when I was younger. I don't know. But now everybody, oh, I digress. Sounds good. Why can't you just say, I got squirrels? Well, because some places eat squirrels. They don't chase them like we do. Oh, that's true. (laughs) That's what uh, Claudette said they do in Canada. She's not in Canada. She's in West Virginia or Virginia. That's the same thing. It is (laughs) the same thing. She is from Canada, but lives in Virginia or West Virginia now. And David made a comment about chasing squirrels. And she said, oh, no, we eat those and squirrels do. Yeah. Yeah. In Canada or West Virginia? In Virginia, <laughs> West Virginia, wherever. That In area. West Canada. No, it's not <laughs> West Canada. See, y'all, I'm telling you, it's going to get off the chain. <laughs> it's going to get off the chain. But I did enjoy having Maria guest because we did talk a lot about nachoing and what it really is. Mm-hmm. And it's very important that people understand what it really is because if it's done wrong, it's going to blow up in your face. And you're not really not doing if you're not doing it right. That's like if you on a Weight Watchers diet <laughs> and you eating 15 coconut cakes in that week, you are not on a Weight Watchers diet. And don't go tell people, oh, I gained weight on the Weight Watchers diet. This thing don't eating. work. Yeah. You wasn't on the Weight Watchers diet. That's, you was on the coconut cake diet. That's like there's another podcast that, that we ran into um, and they were talking. You to, ran into a podcast? Yeah. Ran slap into it. And they were talking. They were talking about the Nacho Kids method, right? Or or Nacho Kids. And then, in the first five seconds, they were like, 
I don't see how that can possibly work. That's a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah. And then they spent the next five minutes talking about how they nacho. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so they're, they're again, they don't understand it. They don't even know what it's about, even the basics of it, because if, unless you've been in the academy, you don't know what it's all about anyway. But just the basics of it, you know, just the basic disengagement, or as I like to call it, tactical disengagement, because there's a process to that. Um, but they didn't even know that part of it. They, I, I think that they thought it's just one of those things where you just ignore the kids mm-hmm. or the step kids because of the way they were talking about it. Because they went on to say, we do X, Y, and Z, which is like, that's exactly part of what we're telling people to do. So um, anyway. I did reach out to her through Facebook to see if she wanted to be a guest on our podcast. I don't think she's read it yet. Yeah. So, yeah. and it's just, and I'm not picking on them. I'm just, it, just to say that people don't understand it. And then some people don't try to understand it, which kind of boggles my mind a bit. And there's a difference in ignoring somebody and not engaging with them. Oh yeah. And if you don't understand the difference, you need to figure it out because <laughs> there is a big difference in ignoring somebody and not engaging. Mm-hmm. Ignoring is walking around with your nose stuck stuck up in the air where if it rains, you're going to drown. Where disengaging or not engaging is just not engaging. Yep. If they say hey to you, you can say hey, but you don't go, hey, how are you doing? Because that would be engaging. That's why I call it tactical disengagement. Yeah. But And and to be clear, that's that's only the like step one of the Nacho Kids Method. There's so much more to it, and we don't get into that on the podcast or in the Facebook group or anything. It's just too in-depth. It's too in-depth. It just can't be done. So Mm -mm. it's only in the academy. Yeah, really, I think the best way to learn it, of course, is to go through the academy and to participate in the Nacho Kids Boot Camp Challenge. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe you should think about selling access to just the challenge. Maybe. I'll have to think about that. Yeah. I put a lot of work into those challenges. Oh, I know. It's tons of work. Yeah. So anyway, interesting idea. Yes. We'll have to think about that. Yep. Oh, we oh. got something else coming up. What? We are going to have people apply for scholarships to the Academy. We haven't figured out the details of how we're going to do this yet because we had a generous donation made to the Nacho Kids Academy. Mm-hmm. Very generous. By a very lovely lady. We can't mention her? No, not right now. I've got to have permission. Okay. Anyway. And I've got to get with her to figure out how we're going to do this. Yep. Because you have some ideas, she has some ideas, and I have some ideas. So we need to all come together because we want to make sure that the people that get these scholarships take full advantage of it. We don't want to give somebody a scholarship and them not use it because mm-hmm. that's one person that's not getting help. Yep. So, so but we're going to take the the money that she donated mm-hmm. and we're going to match it. Mm-hmm. And um, and that way we're able to help twice as many people. That's right. And in the future, we're hoping that maybe other people would make donations and we can match those. Yep. So there's a lot more to come with that. Like I said, I've got to get into the details. Yep. But we'll have some way for people to apply for it. And, um, you know, we don't know what it's going to be uh, yet, but it will be a... It may be as simple as comment on this Facebook post and tell us your story. It may be fill out this form. It may be... I'm not sure Send yet. us your video resume. Oh, that would be hilarious. Oh, it would be, wouldn't it? You know what would be funny, and we're not going to do this, but it would be funny, is if we had a contest for who could leave the dirty sock on the floor the longest, and they win a scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think the like the video application would be pretty cool. That might be that might yep. be a way to do it. But then you have people that aren't tech savvy that might would struggle with that. Or, well, I guess everybody pretty much has a phone now. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we'll figure all of it out. So we definitely have things that we need to figure out about it. But uh, I'm just excited that we have a way to give people uh, at least a temporary free access to the Academy. I I was really excited um, when she mentioned this to me, but I never um, imagined that she would donate the amount that she did. And she is, like I said, just a lovely lady and she wants people to get help. And she knows that the best place to do that is through the Academy. Hopefully she'll let me share her name. At some point, because um, I want to give her a big shout out and tell her how awesome she is to the world. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. But she didn't do it for recognition. I know that. No. No, she didn't. I was shocked as well. I was yeah. like, what? Mm-hmm. So that's why I was like, dude, we need to match it because that would be awesome. And I'm like, what? I'm kidding. I know. <laughs> you were? You were like, what? It's like, <laughs> heck yeah, match it. Let's do it. Let's help some people. David, you make it sound like I was like, oh, no. You was. You was like, I don't want to help nobody. You lie. <laughs> Yeah, dude. I didn't me, want to help people. We wouldn't be doing this podcast. Let me tell you, Lori spent like four hours on a Zoom call the other night helping people with um, with several other stepmom coaches, mm-hmm. and uh, and then she's doing um, this mastermind thing. No, what is it? It's not the mastermind. It's something else you're doing where you're recording a bunch of stuff. I can't tell. I'm, she's looking at me like, don't tell everything yet. Yeah. <laughs> We've mentioned it in previous podcasts, but um, we have found that other people like to copy our ideas. So yeah, I'm going to wait till I launch it. Yeah, but anyway, discuss just, it any further. Just a massive amount of free content that she's lining up to put out, in addition to what's already out there. So it's awesome stuff. All right, anything else? No, I'm good. That's it. That's it. All righty. Well, join us next week, folks, when you hear Lori say. I wish this pollen would go away. (laughs) Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. Until next time, remember, life is good when you nacho.